Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Susma Giri, and like you can see in my shirt, I work with bees in the lawn lab at, in the Department of Zoology and Physiology. So whenever we talk of bees, um, the picture that come to our mind are these two. You can see on your left is the honeybee that produces honey, and on your right is the bumblebee, a big fuzzy bee that is hovering around us. However, there are thousands of other bee species that we tend to ignore or we don't even recognize, like these ones. The green one on the left you see is an osmia, and um, the light green one you see is lesioglossum. That's very, very small. So they are so small that when they are flying, it's so hard to detect them even. And if you want to see those um, bees, you can go to the dandelion flowers in the summer, and there, there are lots of those. So, Bees are important. Um, to give an example, one out of every three bites you take um, is due to the pollination from bees. Um, so for example, here is a figure, picture of a grocery store, and you can see you have lots of uh, fruits and vegetables to choose from. It's possible because of the bees. Uh, suppose we were to remove bees from the ecosystem. This is how your grocery store would look, look like. You don't have much of a choice. Um, and again, you might have heard a lot about um, beekeepers transporting their bees from east to west uh, for pollination of almonds and etc. And that itself indicates bees are really important for pollination. However, a concern is that their population has been declining over the past couple of years. Um, for example, in news recently, since 2006 especially, uh, you might have heard a lot about beekeepers getting worried about their bee colonies dying. Thousands of bees die because of uh, various reasons like pesticide overdose or uh, parasites and etc. So in these conditions, uh, you can um, imagine bees that are really um, good in terms of their health status, they can uh, thrive well in these conditions. So the objective of my study was to assess the bee health status. Basically, by um, I wanted to address two questions. First, what is the status of parasitism in bees that I collect from low and high elevation sites? And second, what is the condi condition of energy levels in these bees? So um, like for we human beings, we need energy. I need energy to come and talk here in front of you. And same is the, we same is the case with bees. If they are trying to f um, escape from their predators or, or if they are trying to fight their parasites, they would need energy. So basically, these two things would kind of um, be a good indicator for bees' health status. And so why did I collect, choose to collect bees from low sites and high elevation sites? Basic, mainly there are two reasons. First, we know it's warmer at low, uh, low elevation sites or base of the mountain versus very cold at the top of the mountain. Um, and um, I was expecting maybe because bees can thrive well, for example, in the snows where it is cold, but not their parasites. Uh, to give you an example for um, in past in Nepal, I come from Nepal, and uh, in Nepal, uh, in the southern part, um, there was um, uh, malaria occurred, and people is, uh, shifted to the northern part where there is cold just to escape the malaria because uh, mosquitoes couldn't go to those colder areas. Mosquitoes are the vector for malaria. And so I was expecting maybe bees at these high elevation sites could um, escape the parasites because it's colder. The second reason um, is we know that at the base of the mountains, people uh, there is a um, higher settlement or there are more people living in the base of the mountains compared to the tops, especially in regions like Nepal. So here you see this picture. This is of Pokhara, the city I am from. And you can see the base of the mountain, there are lots and lots of settlement. But as you go up in the mountains, there are very few settlements. So, so the implication here is that human beings, um, when there, where there is settlement, they tend to uh, perform agricultural practices and use pesticides. Maybe that would affect the bees in the wild. Or maybe be, um, human beings would have these um, apiaries or commercially reared hives. And maybe from commercially reared hives, the disease could spill over to the wild hives. So that was just uh, um, a 
and expectation. That's the reason I collected bees from low and high elevation sites to compare. So I did this study in Nepal here. Uh, the highlighted portion is um, USA, and Nepal lies all the way to the south in between India and China. And that very small, um, if you see that very small um, blue dot, that's Nepal. Um, in Nepal, I studied two kind of bees, um, Himalayan cliff honeybee. Um, as you can see, the name suggests uh, these bees are uh, named so based on um, the hives that they build in the cliffs. And these bees are the largest honeybees of the world. Um, and they are also found in uh, very high elevations compared to other bees. The reason I collected these bees from Nepal is because first, I'm from Nepal and I wanted to study these bees. And second, these bees are only found in um, Nepal, India, Bhutan, and some part of China and nowhere else. And these bees um, also have the cultural importance. You can see people are just going through this ropeway to get the hives. And those people who go there, uh, usually the villagers, they get stung by hundreds of bees and nothing happens. I don't know why. <laughs> so this is one of the bees I collected. And the second one I collected is from the domestic hives, um, oriental honeybees. So like I said, I collected both of these bees from low and high elevation site. And along the same contest, I wanted to show you this picture of Annapurna Base Camp, where you can see us waiting for a um, sunrise view of the Annapurna Range. Um, I'm showing this picture because Annapurna Base Camp is very close to the high elevation site where we collected the bees from. Oh, sorry. And this is the low elevation site where I collected the bees from. If you see in the middle picture, there is a small village, and that's where I collected the domestic bees uh, from, from the villagers' um, hives. And there are very pretty easy and standard ways of collecting the bees. Uh, one is sweeping the nets. If you go to the Yellowstone National Park, mostly you see people with these nets uh, for the butterfly research to cast the butterflies. And uh, we use these nets to cast the bees. However, the other even easier way is uh, using catching the bees when they are getting the nectar from the flower. Once the bee lands in the flower and once they start get drinking the nectar, they are less aware of us around them. And at that time, I take my vial um, and sneakily take them into the vials and bee is in my hand. So once I cast the bees, um, I would euthanize the bees. Oh. Euthanize is a very subtle way of saying that I kill the bees, <laughs> just for their own betterment. And I do measure their, I did measure their weights and process them in the field to um, bring them back to the lab for further analysis. So now getting into my questions. First, let's talk about the parasites I studied. Um, I studied four kinds of parasites in these bees. First is the varroa species, which is an external mite. You can see the blue circle around it. It's something sort of ticks in the dogs, you can see, or so. And to count the number of these parasites, I would put the bees in the icing sugar and shake them very well. So, and that would cause this mite to dislodge from the bee body, and I counted the number of mites. Second, Acarapis udii, which is another mite found in the trachea. So in a, um, we human beings respire through our nose and it goes through the trachea to the lungs and that's how we do respire. And um, same is the case with the bees. The trachea is, um, allows for respiration. And if you see those small dots around the trachea, those are the mites and those are kind of suffocating the bees. <coughs> Excuse me. And the other two parasites I studied were the microorganisms um, in the guts of the bees. To study these three later parasites, I extracted the DNA from the bee body and matched the DNA with the parasite's DNA to detect whether or say whether there is a presence of parasite or not. So what did I find? Um, the good thing is none of the bees were parasitized with none of the parasites. So they were basically, the bees I collected were healthy. So then I moved to my second question. Um, what was the level of energy reserves? When we say energy, similar to us human beings, bees also have these lipids and carbohydrates to break down. Um, <clears throat> and in this graph is a pretty simple um, bar plot showing 
<coughs> the type of uh, energy reserves in the x-axis, lipids, sugars, and glycogen. And y-axis shows the amount of these energy reserves in milligram per milligram of B's mass. And the orange color is shown for the low elevation site bees, or relatively warmer temperature, versus um, blue color for the bees from high elevation site, or relatively colder temperature color. And we didn't find any significant um, difference in energy reserves across altitude. It has to do mostly with the bees' physiology. And <clears throat> but one thing we saw was that among the two bees I studied, the one I collected from wild, the cliff bee, had relatively higher percentage of glycogen. And again, it might have to do with the kind of uh, nectar they get, because these are the wild bees, and they get nectar from um, very rare other flowers, and that's why their um, honey is also considered to have medicinal value. So to compare and contrast with this study in honeybees in Nepal, I also collected bees uh, from various altitudes, bumblebees from Grand Teton National Park. You can see um, on the left side is from peak one, the low elevation site uh, is the lower picture, and high elevation site is the higher picture. And again, another peak second is low elevation site at the low picture, and bottom picture and top picture shows the high elevation site. So one thing you can, um, see here or visualize here is that these other three um, sites are relatively not disturbed with human beings by human beings but you can see that's the Tetons village or and uh, there are lots of settlements and to what we found was that the bees at these sites were relatively more parasitized compared to other sites. So here you see the picture. This is a 400 times magnified, magnified picture of nosemite spores. So um, if you recall, nosemite spores are among <coughs> the various other causes of colony collapse disorder occurring. And we found millions of nosemite spores, the small, really um, kind of cylindrical uh, spores or structures you see, those are the nosema spores, and we found in millions of those. Uh, I do not, I, I, we do not know whether it's because of the human settlements and other stressing factors, but it's certainly something we need to um, consider uh, exploring, and also that, that's what I'd like to do in future. So what's next? Um, like I said, uh, I want to know what might have led to high nosema in bees from the Tetons village. Maybe it's the pathogen spilled over. I don't know if there is any um, commercially reared hives or not. Um, maybe many other stressors coming into play. I want. Um, I will also st um, want to determine uh, energy levels in the bumblebees I collected. And finally, my objective in the future, something I would like to do is study parasites from the commercial hives um, in southern part of Nepal where it's relatively warmer. So with that, I'd like to thank my field crews, my funding agencies, College of um, Arts and Science Saunders Walter Study Abroad Scholarship, National Geographic Young Explorers Grant, and Center for Global Studies Research Excellent Award. And thanks to the Center for Global Studies for providing this platform to share my study. Thank you. <laughs>